Morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the sexual health uh, medical update. Uh, we're going to discuss some evolving issues around STIs and STIs um, uh, in general practice as you GP see it. Uh, this is part of Herzl Hurt CPD series. My name is Lydia and I am a CPD program officer for the inner west and south regions um, in central and eastern Sydney. Uh, also working with us tonight, um, is CPD and events manager, Bertha Harvey. I will start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of um, uh, the land across which we work and meet tonight. I recognize the continuing connection to land, water and community uh, per respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I would also like to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, colleagues who might be joining us tonight. Um, also, uh, the Medical Board of Australia is reminding that there will be no any grace period this year. You must complete all 2024 CPD requirements this year. However, GPs will be able to finalise recording the completed 2024 CPD up until 28 of February 2025. If you have any queries, please reach out to us for more information. And uh, now I would like to invite for the short introduction on uh, upcoming um, syphilis clin uh, training, uh, Elisa Magna, Project Officer, Sexual Health and Bloodborne Viruses, uh, Virus Services, um, South Eastern Sydney Local Health D District. Thank you, Elisa. Thanks, Lydia. I'll just share my screen and then I can go from there. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Okay, perfect. So hi everyone and thanks for, for having me. Um, so as Lydia mentioned, I am um, a project officer with South East Sydney Local District's HARP unit or HIV and related programs unit. Um, and I'm here to introduce and speak to our new um, online learning module, um, which is called CESLID Mini Audit, Increasing Syphilis Screening in Your Practice. Um, it's not yet live, um, but we have plans to have this accessible um, late August. So so we'll definitely share the link of our landing page um, once that is live um, to all participants tonight. Okay. Um, so with this, this course um, is basically it's New South Wales Health's response um, to increase the increasing incidence of infectious syphilis um, that's occurring in New South Wales. So um, I guess some statistics with that. So from 2017 to 2021, inf infectious syphilis notifications in New South Wales increased by 48% for non-Aboriginal people and 103% for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, with female syphilis, rates in New South Wales also more than doubling um, during this period, with most cases occurring in women of reproductive age. Um, so congenital syphilis um, cases have also risen in Australia and New South Wales. Being a preventable disease with um, severe perinatal consequences, our new online learning module focuses on the effective um, on, on the effective management of syphilis for people of reproductive age, those who can fall pregnant and those that are um, already um, during their pregnancy. So this includes timely diagnosis, um, appropriate treatment um, and diligent follow-up um, to prevent complications, further transmission and um, adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, so yeah, with that, it's also like a, um, with GPs, often the first point of contact for patients that um, we would like uh, with STIs, just making a role vital in in early detection and management of syphilis. Um, okay, so then with the the course overview, um, so with that, it's just um, I'd like to note that a specialist um, GP, um, so Yen Lee Lim, who works with both the Albion Centre in Surrey Hills and at Family Planning New South Wales. Um, has been heavily involved in the creation of this online learning module. Um, and the module's components includes a short education package and an audit tool. So again, Yen Li um, was a major contributor in the creation of, of the audit tool using her knowledge and experience within GP, um, um, yeah, GP and general practice. Um, so the learning module comprises of three parts um, and acts like a learning hub. So part one involves um, pre-reading and gaining access to ASHAM syphilis 
decision making tool, which is the comprehensive tool that um, provides guidance on various aspects of, of syphilis management, including screening, testing and, and treatment protocols. Um, part two involves a two um, short 10 minute videos that sets the scene on the importance of testing for syphilis, as well as showcasing um, the purpose of the audit tool and how to actually complete it. And then part three involves data collection and completing the audit tool. Um, and then, so with this, just the learning objectives, increased confidence in managing um, diagnosis of syphilis um, and how to accurately record um, sexual history relating to syphilis diagnosis. Um, and as with this as well, the course um, has been approved by, um, as for CPD activity by RACGP, offering 12 hours of CPD in total. So this can be accrued over 12 months. Um, so it's a one hour will be allocated to education activities when parts one and two of the learning module are completed. Um, and the additional 11 hours of this CPD activity will be allocated to measuring outcomes um, when part three um, or the audit tool is completed and submitted to ASHAM. Um, so for example, with that, 30 minutes of CPD may be awarded for patient testing, while 60 minutes um, may be awarded to, um, for the CPD points. Um, or activity may be awarded if a positive result and follow-up consultation is conducted um, and entered onto the audit tool. Um, and like I said, it, it's not quite live yet, um, but if you do want more information, please contact that email there um, for ASHAM. And yes, I will um, forward the landing page to, to Lydia once um, it, it goes live. So thank you for having me and I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for sharing the uh, presentation notes. We will distribute that among um, uh, among the registered uh, participants today after the event. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce our facilitator, GP facilitator for um, today, Dr. Tokul Duncan Brown, Shire GP and member of GP Advisory Committee for CPD Education in um, Southland Shire. And I would like to thank Tokul for securing the speaker and for the, his support uh, in this session. Over to you, Tokul. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, well, tonight um, uh, we've uh, we're blessed to have uh, uh, a very uh, eminent speaker with us, um, Dr. Brian Flynn. So uh, hopefully you can all see Brian. Brian uh, is uh, is like me. He's a, a UK trained doctor. Uh, after his medical school training in England, he went through what can only be described as a series of personal enlightenments. I feel initially he relocated to Scotland. Uh, his first uh, uh, success, where he completed his consultant training in sexual health. Uh, he then retrained as a GP and finally relocated to Sydney in 2019, where he's been here for the last five years, therefore. Uniquely dual qualified, he, he continues to work furiously hard, not only in general practice in Kirrawee, uh, but also at the RPA Sexual Health Unit in Camperdown. So whilst the Shire is blessed to have his skills and his commitment, he also manages to indeed give his time elsewhere. And he's even represented Australia playing squash. Although <laughs> perhaps that's uh, a trip his ACL would rather have forgotten. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in recognising that when we're asked to uh, for an STI screen by patients, I tend to sort of rattle off a, a pathology form, perhaps without really thinking too much, uh, too much thought behind mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so I think there's probably quite a lot we could improve on there, as we've already heard from uh, uh, Alyssa. Um, tonight, uh, Brian's agreed to update us all on this topic, but also share any other uh, evolving, if that's the right word, uh, sexual health issues. So uh, we're very pleased to welcome you, Brian. Over to you. Wow. Okay. Thank you, um, Talko, for that really lovely introduction. Um, You've made me sound better than I really am, but so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'll start sharing my screen now. Hopefully that'll give you a bit of an idea in terms of my background. I actually came to GP after a very weird kind of uh, meandering career, started in infectious diseases, landed in sexual health, completed my training there, and then rather uh, weirdly then decided to do GP training. So I have both qualifications. Uh, 
Australia is quite a unique place. In, in the UK, it was very, you either do sexual health or GP, but over in um, Australia, you can be uh, a GP with a specialist interest. So I've kind of continued to do lots of sexual health work down in the Shire, and I think I've built up a bit of a reputation in terms of that locally. Um, and then last year, I started working at the RPA Sexual Health Clinic as well to kind of keep, keep up with my skill. So... I'm gonna, I'll start sharing my screen now. Let me know if it doesn't work. Uh, share. I'm not very good with Zoom, everybody, by the way. So um, so hopefully you'll be able to see this. Um, and my computer is not is a bit old, so it says it's not compatible, hence why I've not got a blurring background and you're coming from my kitchen. So, um, uh, so there you go, you've got the personal touch. You can see it well. Thank you, Brian. Is that okay? Yeah. Fantastic. So look, um, I was kind of given a bit of a topic in terms of evolving topics in STIs. STIs don't evolve that quickly, but the medicine sort of slightly does. And there's a few new things on the scene. So look, I'll run through. Um, it's a bit of a, there's quite a lot to get through. And some of them are very short and they're kind of just hopefully hot tips. I work in sexual health and I work in GP, so, and they're very different environments, but we can do sexual health very well in GP if, if you want to, or if you're interested in it. So hopefully at the end of the talk, you'll kind of come away with a bit more knowledge, um, either able to signpost or sort something out yourself. Um, so hopefully some hot tips as we go along, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of kick start. Uh, sorry, at each um, end of each section, I'll just pause a bit. And if there's any questions, put it in the chat function. Uh, talk will, I can't see them in this kind of mode for some strange reason. So talk will, will just kind of let me know if there's any pertinent questions for what I've just talked about. I'm happy to answer them if I can. Um, and then we'll just kind of move, move through it that way. All right. Hopefully this will work. Um, firstly, an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land on what we're meet and where we're meeting today, which for me is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be joining us today. So this is the topic, so and again, apologies, I haven't got any animations. It doesn't work on my computer, so some of the slides look pretty heavy, So, but we'll kind of go through it nice and slowly. If we look at the first six, I'm going to kind of just give you a bit of an update on what I think is kind of a nice way of taking a sexual history in GP. Um, I'm going to talk about correct testing of STIs in different groups of people, because that's something that... Um, you may not be aware that depending on sexuality or gender, there's actually slightly different testings. Um, some pitfalls to try and avoid in sexual health as well. So, so that, that's always an interesting uh, topic to discuss. Chlamydia and gonorrhea are probably going to be the commonest things we see in GP or diagnose in GP. So I just want to kind of uh, make sure that everyone's kind of up to speed with what the treatment or recommended treatment is now for both of those conditions. And just a brief mention about vaccinations for sexual health consultations, because they do get forgotten about um, quite often. Um, and... Um, immunization for people who are sexually active is, is really important. So I'll kind of just pin that down. You'll notice I've underlined PrEP and monkeypox. So they're kind of, they're kind of two of the biggest sections. So I'm going to kind of, kind of slowly work through those. My, my total aim by the end of this talk is that you feel very comfortable to go away and prescribe PrEP. So if you're already doing it, you, you've already won. Um, but if you're not comfortable doing it, then a, you'll kind of see that it's a nice, easy consultation. So it, should, it shouldn't be too hard once you've done it a couple of times. So hopefully I can go through a stepwise process on how to do that. Uh, Monkeypox was a late entry last week. I worked with someone from Cespin and there is a bit of an outbreak. They heard I was doing a talk and said, please tell your GPs about monkeypox. So all of a sudden I've got extra monkeypox slides in there. So it is a late entry. So I'll give you an update there. Now, the ones in italics at the end are doxypep, 
few HIV management kind of things, but also syphilis right at the end. The reason I put them at the end is not that they're not important, but a couple of months ago, one of my colleagues, um, sorry, one of my colleagues, Dr. McCarthy from the RPA, um, also did a CESPN um, talk, uh, primarily to the inner west, but it was online. So if you were part, of, if you were watching that a couple of months ago, there is going to be a bit of duplication. Um, so you're welcome at that point if you feel that you're comfortable with, you know, oh, you've heard enough about doxypep, the HIV management stuff, and syphilis. Um, then you're welcome to kind of log out at that point. So, so by all means, stay if you want a reviser. Um, but hopefully, we'll kind of work our way through these, and yeah, hopefully, it'll be really useful for you, or partially useful. All right. So, look, discussing sexual health and taking history. You're all GPs. You do uh, history taking 20, 30 times a day. So, I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. But if you don't do sexual health consultations that often, then it can feel a little bit awkward. The funny thing is I work in sexual health clinics and GP and the sexual health is the sort of environment and um, it is slightly different in GP practice. So what I mean by that is if you're going to a sexual health clinic as a patient, you expect to be asked quite personal questions. So it doesn't come as any surprise. In the GP setting, you might have known that patient for a long period of time. You know, you might know their family, their husband, their children. So they might feel a bit uncomfortable. There's like an unspoken barrier if you're going to start talking about sexual health. You know, a patient may not want you to know that they're having an affair or judge them too much. So, so because we evolve and develop relationships with our patients, sometimes that in itself can be a little bit of a barrier. So we just need to acknowledge that sometimes that exists. Um, however, you know, I've got a few sort of ways of kind of phrasing that that might be helpful. Again, sorry, my slides are busy. My animations just didn't work. They were supposed to come in sort of nicely one at a time, but it's just screen dumped it, I'm afraid. So, so the key thing about sexual history taking is pretty easy. And what you're trying to gauge here is risk for that patient in front of you so that you can work out what's going to be the appropriate tests. So... What I do in GP land more than I do in the sexual health clinic is I kind of just say to them, hey, I'm going to ask you some personal questions. I often use this phrase. I often say, I'm going to ask you some personal questions, not because I'm nosy. It's just because I want to work out what risk you might have uh, might be at for STIs. And so I can do the correct tests for you. So if you kind of if you kind of throw out that little bit of a warning shot, it means that actually they're expecting kind of personal questions. I think a good starter for all patients, and, and look, this is this is the way I do it. So it's not in a textbook. It's just I thought we, this would be quite useful. So this is, you know, how I do it. I'm sure other people will do it very different. A good starting question is when was your last SCI screen? And the reason behind that is if they've never had one, then that's fine. You kind of know that you kind of, you know, you're going to have to do a bit more explanation, et cetera, of what we're going to do, um, maybe go back a little bit further. But if they say, um, yes, they've had an SCI screen, that's actually great. They've, uh, they've done it before. They know what to expect. And what it gives you is a bit of a benchmark to go from or a, a kind of a, a, a timestamp that you're going to go from. So if they say, for example, yeah, I had an SDI screen about a year ago, I then go, fantastic. Do you remember what you had? Did you have blood swabs? Was it a full screen? Hopefully they'll say yes. And then I go, OK, that's great. Do you remember if anything was positive or negative? Uh, usually negative. Most screens are. But, you know, if it's positive, you make sure it was treated. And that gives you a bit of a time reference to go from. So, so you kind of, you know, if they've had a negative screen a year ago, great. You don't need to go back into their dark, uh, distant past. You've got that timestamp. Then I say, okay, since that STI screen, have you had any change in sexual partners? So very, very open question, very easy question. If they say yes, you can then say, how many? Okay, how many sexual partners? If they haven't had an SDI screen before, I usually use two references of time. I say, how many sexual partners in the last three months? Um, just to kind of get a gauge of recent activity. And then I say, Do you, have you had any other sexual partners in the last 12 months? This will give you a rough estimate as to whether they're having frequent multiple changing partners or whether it's just sort of one regular partner. So what you're trying to ascertain here is risk, all right? 
The next question is actually the most important question you're going to ask because it's a nice way of just knowing uh, who that person in front of you is having sex with, okay? Um, are your sexual partners male, female, or both? It's non-judgmental and it gives you huge amounts of clues as to what testing you're going to do. So I think that's why I've underlined it. It's a, just a really nice way of knowing, you know, you're not using labels, you're not saying, are you gay, straight, etc., because some people just don't identify with those labels. So it is far easier for you to go, are your sexual partners male, female or both? Um, once you've got their information, just check, are these regular partners or casual partners? Okay. So that's kind of, that will give you a very good clue as to that person's uh, risks for STIs. The next part of it, the next question sort of when did you last have sex is purely from a logistical point of view of testing. So what I mean by that is if someone comes in for an STI screen and they had sex two days ago, um, it's almost a little bit, uh, well, it's, it's far too early to do proper testing for that sexual exposure. The things like chlamydia and gonorrhea will routinely take about seven to uh, ten days to show up. Um, obviously things like syphilis and HIV much longer. So if they're asymptomatic and they haven't got any previous risks and they're just worried about that one episode, then in some cases it's perfectly reasonable to say to that patient, we're a little bit early, how about I bring you back in a certain number of weeks? If you develop symptoms in the meantime, obviously come back and see me. Okay, so, so it just allows you to work out those window periods as to whether it's appropriate to test now. Um, and, it, you know, if they want it, you can do it as a baseline so that you can repeat it to see if there's any changes. So, or whether it's an option just to defer it a little bit. Um, the next bit is just about, you know, the level of protection. So um, was that sex protected with condoms, with or without? That then opens the question to what percentage of time do you use um, condoms for sex? So I kind of, I give them kind of four options. I go, you know, is it less than 50%, more than 50% with partners, um, never or always? And just kind of that will give me a bit of a gauge. So if you took that as a bit of a, if you were asking sort of roughly those type of questions to the patient in front of you, you're going to get a really good clue as to what their sexual risk is in terms of STI acquisition. So hopefully that's, that's just kind of my top tips. It, obviously, if they've got symptoms, you then start homing down on what the symptoms are. But this is more about their sexual history um, and potential risk in terms of number of partners, type of partners, etc. All right. So that's, that's it for my sexual history taking. So um, I'll move on to the next section. I can't see if there's any questions, Talk World, so I'm assuming, let, let me know if there yes, is. Yes, um, all, all no questions as, as yet. Oh, good, okay. So look, the next bit I'm gonna move on to is actually the correct testing. Um, and again, I'm so sorry that my slides are, are busy, um, but I'll just walk through them one at a time. So this is the correct STI screening for the person in front of you. And initially I'm talking about asymptomatic screens, okay? So we'll just take it one at a, one at a time. So if you've got, a, and I'm sorry, I'm literally going back to basics here. So I'm pretty sure virtually all of you will know this already, but I'm just wanting to make sure everyone does. So if you if your patient is a cisgender heterosexual man, then basically you're going to do offer them two tests, a first void urine or first catch urine uh, for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Uh, the abbreviations here are chlamydia trypomatous and gonococcus. So sorry, you'll see those abbreviations quite a bit. So urine sample, chlamydia, gonorrhea, PCR, and blood, HIV, and syphilis. Very basic screen, very straightforward. Obviously, if they give you additional history, you can decide they might need additional tests on, but that will be your basic screen for an asymptomatic. Um, cisgender uh, woman, um, basically the same sort of tests, but offer a high vaginal swab. Um, remember, high vaginal swabs, um, taken by the patient are as um, uh, uh, sensitive at picking up infections as clinician taken swabs. So if they're asymptomatic, there's certainly no reason to, for doctors or nurses to be doing those swabs. They can do it themselves. Uh, it makes people much more comfortable. Uh, so high vaginal swab and obviously bloods for HIV and syphilis, that's standard through all the tests. I just put in brackets here as a bit of a reminder not to, uh, well, to try and avoid, um, preferably not, to do urines for women for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Uh, the reason behind that, the, 
the best way I can phrase this is if you are chlamydia and gonorrhea, you prefer the cervix, you know, that's, that's where you want to set up home. Um, and so the DNA of both those infections will be in vaginal secretions um, and um, endocervical secretions. So that's why the high vaginal swab is so much more effective. Um, you don't always get colonization or infection of the urethra in women simultaneously. And equally, there might not be enough sort of secretions or DNA material around the urethra. So that when you just do a urine sample, you may not wash any of that kind of DNA into the so you might be falsely reassuring them. So it's just to avoid urines in women for um, STI screens. Um, from when I was a kind of baby doctor in sexual health, I think it said that the yield was about 30% less uh, from a urine than a high vaginal swab. So I don't know if that's still the case, but I just never do urine samples in women for, um, for chlamydia and gonorrhea for that reason. So it's always a high vaginal swab. If you find out from your excellent history taking that you've just done that you your uh, male patient is having sex with other men, then it needs a broader spectrum um, uh, testing. Uh, basically, you're going to do what we call a three site screen. So you're going to do throat swab, uh, urine sample. So first of all, urine again, but also rectal swabs as well. Um, and again, they'll all be for chlamydia and gonorrhea PCR. Patients can do this themselves. You don't need to do it for them at all. Um, top tip with the throat swab, make sure you've got a mirror in your uh, GP bathroom because it's really difficult to do without a mirror. So I tell patients, you can do your own throat swab, off you go to the bathroom, uh, swab each where, where your tonsils live, I always say, or if you don't have them where they used to live. And then I say, see the dangly bit at the back, touch the wall behind it. If you've gagged, you've done it correctly. OK, so patients can do that themselves. Rectal swabs are very difficult to go wrong. Basically, pop it up your bottom. Uh, need to kind of twist it around for about 10 seconds to get enough material and a first void urine. Um, I have seen um, lots, uh, lots of patients have come over to me in, in GP practice who are MSM, um, who are very surprised that they're doing a throat and rectal swab because they've only ever been offered a urine uh, sample for their screen. So we're missing out on those reservoirs for potential infection. So it's just a reminder, if you've got a, a MSM, as a man who has sex with men patient, always do three site collection, okay? Some patients will say, well, I don't do anal sex. I still get them to do a rectal swab. I just say, look, they're sticky bacteria, they can get anywhere. So it's probably worthwhile you just do it anyway, all right? So um, obviously they can decline it, but I still suggest they do it. Blood tests are always going to be HIV, syphilis as standard. If you're meeting an MSM for the first time, it's a good idea to just check their hepatitis A, B, C status. And I always check their immunity just to make sure that to see whether we need to boost their hepatitis B or they might have missed out on it. Um, you may from your sexual, I've just included this because um, I see it a lot in the sexual health clinics, uh, sex workers, but I have actually got a few sex workers of my own down in the Shire. Um, and that's only because I've asked them, you know, um, through the sexual history. So it certainly happens. Um, if um, you are seeing someone who's a sex worker, the recommendation is you do the routine swab, so high vaginal, bloods for HIV and syphilis, but include a throat swab as well. Um, if they kind of say that they also take part in uh, anal intercourse, then you essentially include a rectal swab as well. Um, lots of sex workers, particularly up in the city, are sort of from Asian communities, so where hepatitis is a bit, uh, is much more common. So again, much like the MSM screening, I'll, I'll just do an initial kind of hepatitis screening as well and just make sure they're vaccinated. So this was just a reminder for asymptomatic screens as to if your patient is sat in front of you that you're choosing the correct tests for them. Okay, so that's that. If they're symptomatic, and look, I'm not going to go through each presentation, um, but if the, you, you now know that's the basic test for asymptomatics, you're doing all those anyway. If they've got symptoms, then um, obviously you add on the additional tests. Um, and this is just a bit of a summary of the things you might want to add on. So if they're talking, if they say, actually, I've got some ulcers, then obviously you're thinking of herpes, so you can do a herpes swab. Don't forget you can do a syphilis PCR swab. So if you're thinking it might be a syphilitic chancre or canker, I never know which way is the connect, uh, correct 
pronunciation. Uh, so if you're thinking it's a, I would say Shankar, um, then you can do um, a syphilis PCR swab. I can't tell you which swabs they are because they're different from different laboratories. So, so you need to check with your um, own provider or who gives you your swabs, which ones are for which, okay? Um, but you can do a syphilis PCR swab. I'm going to come back to monkeypox, but we now need to put in our brains that if someone's presenting with an ulcer, we now need to start thinking of monkeypox as well. But I'm going to talk about that much later so that you can kind of get an overview of that. OK, so that's if they're presenting with ulcers. Um, if we have a lady who's presenting with vaginal discharge, then you're just adding on a high vaginal for um, MCNS, which I'm sure you would all do. Um, if they have no pain um, and their STI, you know, you just want an STI screen, Screen, they mention high vaginal discharge, they can just take their own high vaginal swab. You don't need to examine them. You can if that's the kind of things that, you know, routine you've gotten into, but you can certainly um, get patients to do self-collected high vaginal swabs as well. You may not get an immediate diagnosis. Some people like to examine, do the pH paper, and if that's, if that's what you like to do and you've got time to do that, by all means. Um, if not, high vaginal swab, you'll usually have it back in a day or two, and then you can kind of guide if any treatment for BV and thrush um, is necessary. The reason I've mentioned gonorrhea culture there is obviously heavy vaginal discharge can be gonorrhea, but it would usually present with other symptoms. It would usually present more of a PID type picture. Um, so if they say, actually, this, this discharge is super heavy, I'm a little bit sore, I'd be going more down the PID pathway, which I'll just mention uh, shortly. I wouldn't be getting patients to do self-collected gonorrhea cultures. If I'm thinking of they need one, then I'm gonna examine to make sure they haven't got PID. Uh, urethral discharge, uh, talking about men here, um, um, make sure you do a gonorrhea culture at the time you're seeing them as well. Uh, PID and proctitis, obviously they're the severe presentation, the severe end of presentations of STI. It doesn't happen uh, with everybody. I'm fairly comfortable kind of looking after things like PID or proctitis because I see it all the time. Um, I appreciate that sometimes um, People aren't comfortable sort of working out whether this is PID. If you are, they need a clear need a clear examination and by manual. And if there's lots of pain there, we tend to just over, you know, we treat there and then it's far best to cover for potential PID at that point, then leave and wait for the test results. Um, but if you're thinking about PID, you've got your routine, you know, your um, PCR test for chlamydia gonorrhea, but you must do a gonorrhea culture, high vaginal swab, but this is where you add on a mycoplasma genitalium. Um, and I, I'll mention that again in a minute. So there's a few extra tests. Proctitis, again, don't forget STI. So it's my, primarily in the MSM population who are having condomless um, anal intercourse, receptive anal intercourse, can present with a proctitis. And that's, you know, they'll present with usually discharge, uh, blood, tenismus, altered bowel habit, abdo pain, um, varying degrees of severity, as you can appreciate. Some people are very unwell, and it depends on what the cause is. Common culprits are gonorrhea and chlamydia. They're the most common causes. Um, but then you can have sort of really nasty things like lymphogranuloma venereum or LGV. Um, and also monkeypox now, the new kid on the block. Um, it can present with a proctitis. I think if you see someone who you took a sexual history and is presenting with those type of symptoms, um, like I say, I'm more than comfortable to deal with that in a GP setting, but I totally appreciate most people wouldn't be. So I would be um, referring them to your local sexual health clinic because then they can do things like anoscopy and gram staining and things like that. Inevitably, it's like PID. You tend to kind of treat to cover most things whilst you're waiting for the test results because they can get pretty nasty. All right. So that's just a quick update in terms of asymptomatic screening and the test that you'd add on depending on the kind of presentation. So hopefully that will give you a bit of food for thought should you see a patient with any of those symptoms or just a routine screen to make sure you're doing the right, uh, the right tests. All right. Any questions? No, stony silence. Um, okay. Yeah, no, there's, there's, um, there's no, no questions coming up yet. No I'm, 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 I might just talk. You're going to talk a little bit more about M10 later, are you? I am, yes. The, um, yeah, M10. Actually, I'm about to talk about it in my pitfalls. So, um, yes, um, the, the, uh, 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 my lack of love for M10. I'll explain why in a minute. Okay. 
So look, I'm just going to talk about a few pitfalls in STI testing. So, because um, it's quite easy to fall into these little traps and you end up with these kind of odd or very awkward consultations. Um, so I'm just going to kind of mention my probably biggest bugbear um, is testing HSV serology. Uh, so blood test for herpes. Um, this is my own opinion. It's not written in a book. My advice is never do it. If you're thinking about it, don't, and send them to a sexual health clinic. Um, HSV serology, I do see it from time to time where people have had it as part of a routine screen, and it's just the most useless test. Um, for it, it doesn't answer what you want it um, to answer. So what I mean by that is if you do HSV serology, essentially you're looking for someone who's got antibodies to either type 1 or type 2 uh, herpes, or both, okay? The difficulty with that is most of us have got antibodies to it anyway. So globally, it's thought that um, uh, the population, 80%, 70 to 80% will carry antibodies to type one, um, between about 30 to 40% will carry antibodies to type two. Uh, it takes a while for the serology to become positive, so there's false negatives, um, and you can actually get false positives as well. So as a test, it's not brilliant. So if you're doing it as a routine screen, essentially what you're doing is you're telling someone they've got herpes, <laughs> um, even though that's probably, you know, they, they might have the virus, but that herpes may well be dormant forever, never cause them a problem, never awaken, yet you've given them this kind of, this label that, oh yes, um, we've, we've got herpes. Um, if you even do it when they've got ulcers, there's actually zero way of telling whether that, serology is actually the true cause of that genital ulcer. I mean, you can put two and two together and say yes. Um, but so, so my point being is don't do it for a diagnosis of herpes. What you need to be doing in that particular case is always swabbing the lesion. So it's kind of catching the thief at the bank vault. You kind of need to just keep swabbing the lesion to kind of pick up type one or type two, because then you are certain uh, that that is an outbreak of herpes. So there's only two scenarios where HSV serology kind of comes into its own and is relatively helpful. One is pregnancy, because obviously we know that if ladies have their very first outbreak in the third trimester of pregnancy, having never, ever had an outbreak before, then that's, that can be passed on to the neonates. So that tiny little window is the most dangerous time. You know, it's very, you know, in, in that lady's lifetime, um, it's a very little window to pick up their first episode of herpes. So it doesn't happen that often. Um, but if you've got a pregnant lady and their partner is known to have genital herpes and having sort of recurrence, it's not a bad idea to just test uh, the pregnant lady to see if she actually carries antibodies to it, because then you know that she already carries antibodies, there's no risk of acquisition, a new acquisition during pregnancy, so there's then no risk to the neonate, okay? If we don't have antibodies, then that's where you kind of give advice about suppression in partner, avoiding sex late on in pregnancy, use of condoms, all of those type of things to reduce transmission rates. So HSV so serology has a very specific uh, use in that particular time window. Um, the other time it's useful is if you're getting people present with recurrent ulceration or sort of neurological symptoms. What I mean by that is sort of tingling, pain, odd kind of sensations. Um, you're swabbing but you're not getting, uh, you've, you've repeated swabs are negative. Um, it, it's sensible to do it um, but it's only useful if it's negative. This is the problem. Um, what you're thinking about there is things like, uh, I always pronounce it bechets or bechettes. Um, you sort of, that's part of the diagnostic pathway there. But you can see they're the only two times where I'd say HSV serology has a role. Any other time I wouldn't ever be going down that minefield because what you end up telling someone is that they're, they've got herpes. Um, and it may actually be that they never, ever have a symptom, never have an outbreak, but you've given them that label. Um, and people hate herpes. They have such a bad reaction to it. So herpes consultations can be very long, sometimes longer than HIV diagnosis consultations. So, so I try and avoid herpes serology, always swab the lesion. And if it's negative, just keep swabbing it each time they have an outbreak. Hopefully, eventually, you'll pick up the type. Okay. Just talking about HSV suppression, so another sort of 
pitfall that some people fall into with HSV suppression is it's important that you, if you're going to put them on suppression, it's important that you trial trial them off it every now and again. So what I mean, what I mean by that is, I've got I've inherited a few patients recently, and one's uh, one's been on Valtrex for ten years, um, and was put on it from her very first outbreak, um, and has just continued to take Valtrex forever, you know, unquestioning, paying for it every month. She probably doesn't even need it. Okay, so the way that HSV suppression, so the way I do HSV suppression is when I see them and it might be their first outbreak, I kind of hopefully get a type, type one or type two, give them a bit of counseling. And I say to them, look, in the next year, you're probably going to get an outbreak or two, uh, 50% uh, likely with type one, uh, about 60 to 80% with type two. And as we all know, type two is more prone to recurrence uh, than type one. So what I do in those is I tell people, look, this is how you, if you get a recurrence, this is how you're going to manage it. Okay. Recurrences tend to be much better than the first outbreak. So if it's very mild, if it's a couple of days, soreness, bit of irritation, but you're otherwise fine, you actually don't need to treat that at all. You know, you don't need antivirals for that. It's going to be self-limiting. So you kind of say to them, take some Panadol if it's a bit sore, you know, no sexual activity and that'll sort itself out. So the majority of people with very mild recurrences occurrences may well choose to just treat symptomatically and that is fine if that's suitable for them. If it's particularly severe or frequent you may then choose the episodic treatment. So episodic treatment as we know is where you give them kind of three, I, I, three days of Valtrex I think is fine so uh, 500 milligrams BD for three days at uh, the start of an attack and that's usually enough to kind of either stop it in its tracks or make it much milder and shorter. Um, so I always tell people the whole point of it is to try and make it milder and shorter, but sometimes you can stop the episode. If after the end of that first year, that patient has had multiple episodes needing to treat episodically, then we have a conversation about suppression. So I certainly don't put them on suppression from the first outbreak or even a second or even a third. I get them to treat it episodically. So you keep, keep a box at home. If after a year, because by then if it's type one, it actually gets much less, not always, but much less. But if after a year they're still having outbreaks, then we have a conversation about suppression suppression so and they may be fine with taking it episodically or they might go no I wouldn't mind having a bit of a break from this if they choose to kind of go on suppression six months so I pop them on it for six months and then this is the really important thing so you kind of say look we're going to stop it at six months what will happen when we stop it is you will get an outbreak so that's called a rebound outbreak so for some reason when you suppress it and you stop you often get a rebound outbreak then I say to the patient, we'll treat that just like we would any old episode, three days if you get that rebound outbreak. And then the question is, what happens then? Okay, will they get another attack? Hopefully not. Hopefully suppression's worked um, and that's it. They don't need any more. If their episodes come back just as frequent, then six months wasn't enough. And then you pop them back on it and you do 12 months. Okay, and you do exactly the same. Take them off at 12 months, warn them about the rebound outbreak and then see how it goes. They might, you know, it might be much less frequent or stop altogether. And that's how suppression is supposed to work. So you kind of do six months, see, see how they are off it, then do 12 months, see how they're off it, 18 months. So you can kind of see that you just build up over time. Um, some people will need it long term, but they're very rare. OK, and we know that because our waiting room is not full of old people. OK, herpes has been around for generations. So, you know, our parents and grandparents would have had it, but we don't see people with outbreaks um, in their later years because it burns out at some point. So what we're doing with suppression is we're just trying to suppress it whilst it's active and hopefully then stop it. But some people will continue to have uh, suppression, but not many people need to be on Valtrex long term. And I certainly wouldn't be putting it after their first or second episode, you need to see if they need that because it's quite a big um, kind of commitment to take a tablet every day. So, so that's my kind of slight bugbear with herpes suppression. The answer is do it short and sharp. Um, I say short, six months, 12 months, 18 months, um, but always with the intention of trialing them off it to see whether they still need it because um, I don't know how expensive it is, but if you don't need a medication, you don't need a medication. Um, mycoplasma genitalium is um, 
it's like the chronic fatigue of the STI world. It's a very, <laughs> um, there's a school of thought as to whether it's really an STI or whether it isn't an STI. So, so my general advice here, a bit of a pitfall as well, is never order it on a routine screen or an initial screen. There's only two caveats to that. One is if they have PID, I do want to know if they've got mycoplasma. The other one is that if they're a contact of PID. It's difficult to not test a contact of PID, but um, the guidelines say test contact. So, But if you're just doing a routine asymptomatic screen, never add on a mycoplasma genitalium. There is a reason why. So MGen, as we call it in the business, so that's the whole reason. So the majority of people who actually carry the infection actually don't develop any disease state at all, and they never will. And they may have it for months, years, and it never bothers them whatsoever. So it's only a small proportion of people who actually then develop kind of symptoms with it. Men tend to get off lightly with it. It's usually urethral irritation and a bit of discharge presents very similar to chlamydia. Um, it's very rarely that it's more exciting than that. In women, unfortunately, it can cause PID. So that's why we do want to, whenever we're seeing someone, we suspect PID. It's sensible just to check for that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be looking for it in asymptomatics um, or on routine initial screens. Because the problem is, is if you find a positive result, you are then duty bound to try and treat it. And that's where it becomes really difficult. So if you see, this is, this is from our um, manual of treatment for mycoplasma at... Um, uh, the, the RPA where I work. Um, and these are also on the Australian SCI guidelines for GPs as well, which I'll mention in a, um, in a little bit. So you found your positive MGen result. Um, the issue is, is about 60% in Australia are macrolide resistant. So uh, that's only 40% that will go with the regime of a week of doxy followed by azithromycin. Um, if you're talking about um, MGen in the MSN population, it's almost 100% macrolide resistant. So if you, so when you get an MGen result, it will tell you whether it's macrolide resistant or not. So it has a little comment underneath it. So you must pay attention to that. If it's macrolide uh, sensitive, then you give them a week of doxy. The doxy is not the treatment. Uh, so basically what doxy does is it weakens the mycoplasma so that you then kill it off with the second antibiotic. So that's how it works. It sort of debulks, weakens. Uh, that's the best way I can phrase it, so that the second antibiotic is to try and clear it and kill, okay? If it's macrolide uh, resistant, which most of them are, you then have to give them moxifloxacin. So uh, so week of doxy, the same, but then they're followed by a week of moxifloxacin. A couple of problems with moxifloxacin. It's really expensive, um, routinely about 80 to 100 bucks. Um, you're inevitably finding it in young, uh, young people who... Um, might not have a hundred bucks to spare um, and it has the same problems of things like Cipro so it has the gut problems um, and it has the tendinopathy problems that you can find with Cipro so you've got to kind of pre-warn them about those things um, and then you you feel duty bound to bring them back in four weeks to do a test of cure and you find that it's still there and it's just a huge can of worms then because then you're like what do we do with that if that's the situation you found yourself in I would refer them into a sexual health clinic because we're pretty comfortable at leaving people with MGen um, it's actually quite difficult to clear um, most people don't have symptoms with it so if their symptoms are fully settled down they're still positive then we'll often say to people look that's fine you know it's the kind of the best we can hope for we've got to hope it clears let's never test it unless you get any symptoms if they obviously still have symptoms you've got to go down this very difficult pathway of ordering in uh, pristinomycin worldwide shortage very expensive you have to get special permission fill out lots of forms so it's a tricky one to treat so my my kind of advice for people is don't do it as part of an asymptomatic screen because you'll just find it and and it's likely that you'll find it in a patient who has, is never going to have a problem with it sounds weird doesn't it that you're actually actively ignoring a uh, bacteria but most people uh, will be fine with it it's indicated only in specific symptoms so the way I do it is if someone's coming with a urethritis so dysuria urethral discharge um, I'll do my usual asymptomatic screen if it's all negative and they still have uh, symptoms that's when I'll test for mycoplasma PID I'll test for it on the first consultation okay um, and the only other time is if you come in and they are an MGen 
contact, but you only screen their current partner. You don't need to kind of go back tracing because you'll just find it. So, and the reason behind that is the person in front of you is usually symptomatic. That's how you found it. Um, it might be asymptomatic in their partner, but you're going to try and clear it in both of them because if they get it back, that person is obviously prone to developing symptoms with MGEN. So you're trying to clear it in both of them. So my gen, so that's just a bit of an overview with MGEN. It causes us a bit of a head scratch in the RPA clinic. Sometimes we just retreat with Doxy and Moxie, and the second time it seems to go, they have a few months break of it, and we go, let's try it again. Sometimes it seems to clear, but it does it does seem to clear naturally in some people. So we do just follow it in some cases, uh, particularly if they're asymptomatic. All right. So that's a bit of an overview in terms of a few pitfalls to try and avoid, primarily MGen, but definitely HSV serology. Um, and with suppression, just kind of reserve it for when it's really needed. Okay. Uh, any questions, Torquil? Uh, yeah, there's one or two here. I think that I'm hopeful some of these have just been answered already, but um, uh, there was one about uh, coronary culture. Um, do you mean that we need to take a swab separately for gonorrhea culture for MCNS in addition to the PCR swab. Um, yeah. 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 So yeah. The reason behind that is when you're doing, say you do an asymptomatic screen, or actually whether they have symptoms, if you're doing the kind of Aptima or the NATS test, it's very binary. It's just looking for DNA. It's just looking for a yes or no answer. We know, this is specific to gonorrhea, we know that there's increasing antibiotic resistance. So the important thing is, is before that patient is gonna get treated for their gonorrhea, we must do a culture, okay? It's not gonna change their management there and then, because you're still gonna treat them. But wherever you found the gonorrhea culture, and I will mention this when I talk about gonorrhea treatment, take a chart it's the, usually the black charcoal swab so say say you do a screen and you find that the, a, a guy's got throat and rectal uh, no symptoms you bring him back for gonorrhea treatment before you stab him in the bottom with his antibiotic do a throat and rectal gonorrhea culture okay the, before they have an antibiotic the importance of that is it's not changing that guy's management there and then but it goes off and it gets tested against susceptibility so it's essentially part of surveillance um, and you'll get written um, back a kind of if it's positive they'll then say fully sensitive etc unfortunately there is out there some kef triaxone where it's partially resistant and then it's really important then that we follow up those people because we don't want that to be kind of released into the community. So, so right. if you find a gonorrhea, it's do a culture before you treat. And they're on the same time, yeah. Or if they've obviously got symptoms, you do a culture at the time, yeah. There was um, uh, a comment, I think, um, from uh, Kathy mentioning that there were some some scenarios where HSV serology can be useful, and I think you covered that. Um, there was a, a comment about glad, um, herpes gladiatorium. I, I don't know much about that, I'm afraid, um, uh, in some thoughts. Knowing, uh, is that something you can comment on, Brian? Sorry, I, di I, di I didn't hear the question properly. Sorry. Her herpes gladiatorium outbreaks uh, in certain sports, knowing who's at risk of transmission or not. No, absolutely nothing to do with my area. I have no no, yeah, no. There was a question about um, Candida glabrata in, in um, my thesis, whatever it's called now. Um, I'm not sure whether that's something that you would cover or, or whether that's something more for, um, for gynecologists. Uh, uh, maybe that was something yeah. you'll come to at the end. Yeah, look, um, I wasn't going to particularly cover it. If you do a high vaginal swab and you find it, then it basically just needs slightly different treatment. Um, um, on the Australian SDI guidelines, I think it has a section. So instead of using the usual kind of um, kind of antifungals, it'll, you'll just use a different one. So yeah. so it, it's not common, but if you find it, it just needs a slightly different treatment. And uh, and Eva, I think your question about toxic versus uh, azithromycin and the, and the sequential use there has been answered by Brian already. So we'll perhaps just keep it moving, conscious of time. All right, no worries. Look, I'll whiz through the next two because actually I'm sure everyone's doing this already. And I, I, again, um, it's it's just to make sure we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. 
if you haven't ever seen this website, save it um, as one of your tabs because it's just incredibly useful. So I'm sure all of you have seen it. So it's the Australian STI Management Guidelines um, for use in primary care. Just type in Australian STI Guidelines GP and this will pop up on Google. Save it because it literally has all the STI syndromes and it has very clear um, how to manage uh, those strategies, what the up-to-date treatment is. So, so I'm not going to cover everything today. That would be impossible. But I'd save this on your kind of uh, internet so that you can access it should anyone come in. All right. Um, even has an update on monkeypox, so you can kind of click on that, which I'll come to later. Um, Sorry, this is a bit blurry, but again, it's just the, the take home message for treatment of chlamydia is it's pretty much doxycycline. OK, um, apart from one scenario. So your first line now is doxy. So a couple of years back, we all used to kind of throw out azithromycin, the one gram stat, very convenient, very easy for the patient. You know how fantastic just to take two tablets and not have to think about chlamydia again. And now it's all changed. So I think it was November last year or the year before the guidelines got revised. There's been some azith azithromycin failures or it's kind of an emergence of azithromycin failure. So it's being relegated to an alternative rather than first line. So it should be doxycycline pretty much when you find a chlamydia, doxycycline, unless of course there's kind of complications with doxycycline. So uh, seven uh, 100 milligrams BD for seven days, and it doesn't matter kind of whether it's throat, penis, vagina, or rectum, it's seven days of doxy. The, you can still give azithromycin, but I, I so I very rarely do it. But I only do if I'm a bit worried that they won't take a seven day course. So if they're a bit kind of, you know, the evidence would suggest they're not very compliant, then maybe one, you know, so you can do the alternatives. Um, but it should be always doxy um, because there's less failure rate with that. Um, the alternative is obviously you can't give doxy in pregnancy, so you still have to give azithromycin. Um, and the important thing about that is you will always do a test of cure in pregnancy to make sure that it's actually cleared. Um, I've left um, rectal LGV. You're probably not going to get involved in that too much. Uh, so LGV is the nasty cousin of chlamydia. So it's a, it's a subvariant of it, which causes pretty horrific usual proctitis symptoms. Um, and because it's a chlamydial species, it needs it's doxy again, but it needs a very prolonged um, course for 21 days. But I imagine most of those would uh, find their way into a sexual health clinic. I'd be prescribed, I'm surprised. I've never diagnosed an LGV in GP. Uh, I've diagnosed it in sexual health clinics. But um, yeah, if you do, it's 21 days. And I'd be speaking to the sexual health clinics if you find it. All right. Do we do a test of cure for, um, for chlamydia? No, is the answer. So you can just kind of forget about it. Um, apart from if they're pregnant, or particularly if you've treated anal rectal infection with azithromycin, because that seems to be the highest failure rate with azithromycin. Anyone who's had doxy, you certainly don't need to bring back. It's thought to be pretty um, effective. If you are going to do it, wait until after four weeks, because um, I'm sure you're aware that the there's persistent chlamydial DNA, so the dead DNA lying around for quite a while, and the test's so sensitive that it will pick up that dead bacteria. Um, and if, so if you do it early, you mu you've muddied the waters. Is this reinfection? Is it kind of the false positive from the old infection? So just leave it for four weeks or longer. So ideally, don't do it at all. You don't need to do a test of pure anymore for chlamydia but if you are going to do it particularly for those situations um, then leave it at least four weeks okay um gonorrhea um so just i wish i had my little pointer but i can't but if you just look at the table on the left so first first situation uncomplicated genital or anal rectal infection most gonorrhea is uncomplicated so even if it was part of a PID you'd still call it uncomplicated so uh, I'm not entirely sure what they consider complicated I presume that systemic um, spread in which case they'd go to the hospital but we're only ever going to see uncomplicated genital or anal rectal infection so you give them the 500 milligrams of ketraxone really easy to do in the GP practice uh, mixes nicely with uh, uh, like Decane, um, injection into the buttock, and I give uh, you give them one gram of azithromycin at that time. So they're both antibiotics are for treatment of gonorrhea. 
If it's pharynx, the throat, uh, the clearance rate there, uh, the penetration of the azithromycin is not as good as the rest of the body as genital skin. So they actually, so they still need the 500 milligrams of ketraxone, um, but you just need a higher dose, the two grams um, of azithromycin. So it's just to kind of point out there's a slight difference in terms of the azithromycin um, dosage. Um, if we ignore that, I don't think you're, going to see gonococcal conjunctivitis. Um, I guess if you do, um, I haven't seen it for about 20 years, so this has been a long time. Um, if you do, you just need a higher dose of um, kef um, keftraxone. Um, they usually go to the eye hospital rather randomly, so that's where that's usually diagnosed. They very rarely come into kind of GP clinics, um, but you can, if you find it, then that's the guidance, just a higher dose of keftraxone. Um, just the three points down the side. So as I've mentioned earlier on, before you give them an injection, please do a gonorrhea culture at the site that's positive, okay? Um, just so we can try and send that off for antibiotic surveillance. So that's really useful. Um, but you just treat them there and then. You obviously don't wait for the culture result because you know it's already positive from the NATS test. Now, this is interesting. So say you saw someone who quite clearly on the day had quite profuse urethral discharge. You were like, mm, that looks like gonorrhea. Um, there's something called the kitchen roll sign that I was told about when I was training in sexual health many years ago. Uh, so the kitchen roll sign is that the discharge from uh, men's urethra is so heavy that guys stuff their kind of underwear with kitchen roll and toilet paper um, to kind of absorb it just to get out the, out the house to come to a sexual health clinic there's not many things that cause that that's usually gonorrhea so if it's a heavy discharge and if you see that you're like i'm going to treat you for gonorrhea today before we even know what the test results are because that's pretty convincing of gonorrhea if you've then done a full screen and you actually find out so you give them your 500 milligrams your one gram uh, 500 milligrams keftraxone you give them the one gram of azithromycin because you're treating genital if they subsequently come back and you find they've got throat gonorrhea then you go oh hold on oh they should have had two grams of azithromycin you know but that's often days down the line that you find that out because the results may not come back you do not need to then fire you don't need to bring them back for retreatment you don't need to fire a one gram of azithromycin a few days later assume that the one gram is going to have worked but this is really important that you make sure they come back for a test of cure okay um, and the other thing is if they're co-infected, so if you do a screen and it's actually they've got chlamydia and gonorrhea, which is quite common, the azithromycin component of the treatment for gonorrhea is not enough for the chlamydia. So they also need a week's course of doxycycline. Okay, so hopefully that in GP, it'll be chlamydia and gonorrhea that will be the main sort of things that you kind of are actively treating. Um, and some syphilis if you get excited by that. Uh, we do still do test of cures in in GP. Um, there's various reasons as to why we don't do it in sexual health clinics, which will just muddy the waters. But for the sake of GP land, I would still encourage to bring everyone back for a test of cure. The Australian guidelines say at two weeks. I kind of I kind of leave it a little bit longer, kind of three weeks, just to kind of make sure. Um, and it's really just to make sure that all of those areas are previously cleared. You don't need to do culture. You're just doing a NATS test at that point. Uh, rather bizarrely, the DNA for gonorrhea disappears much more quickly than the one of chlamydia if you're wondering why this can be done at two weeks and the chlamydia can be done at four weeks so so i bring them back at two to two to three weeks just to make sure that their gonorrhea is cleared okay any questions from that um no no, uh, no more questions at this stage yeah. Um, just a brief mention on contact tracing, because it sounds like this kind of crazy thing that only sexual health clinics can do, but we can actually do it as GPs and it's super easy. Um, you don't need to get involved, you don't need to start kind of taking names and addresses and driving around their houses and, you know, giving them kind of injections. From a GP point of view, I just want to let you know about uh, these um, kind of resources as well that might be useful for patients. So SDI... Um, the Australian STI guidelines page, which I showed you. So if you diagnose something, it'll tell you about how far to go back for contact tracing. And pretty much in, G in, in GP land and sexual health clinics, I, I, I just say, hey, you've got gonorrhea, uh, ha you've had so-and-so number of sexual partners in the last so-and-so time. Are you happy to let them know you've got gonorrhea? Okay. 
If they say, yeah, I will text them all, I'm going to document that. Okay, patient happy. There you go. You've completed your contact tracing. Okay, we don't do anything more special than that at a, at a sexual health clinic, unless the patient says, "I'd really like some help with it." Then there's some. Then there are some counsellors who can kind of support them. Ninety-nine percent of the times, people are very much, "Yeah, I'll just let them know. That's fine." Um, if they do feel a little bit kind of weird or you know um, about messaging a partner, there are these res uh, resources um, online. So. Um, you just put it into Google, let them know, um, or the drama down under. They're actually part of the same website. Um, I think let them know is kind of supposedly aimed at uh, more heterosexual people and the drama down under sort of the LGBTQ, but it's actually the same kind of people who set it up. Um, and basically, rather nicely, you type in your partner, your casual partner or your regular partner, um, their detail, their mobile phone, phone number, the STI, and this service generates a text message or email to them, depending on what you give them, and it's completely anonymous. Um, so, so this is an alternative way that people can use kind of contact tracing. Um, there's also at the top, just that website, um, I'm not sure whether many people have heard of SHIL, so it's the Sexual Health Information, I think it's Information Link, you can just type SHIL New South Wales. Um, that, that's a great resource for kind of sexual health, finding vaccines, stuff like that. Um, but it also has a, a page on supporting with contact tracing. As GPs, we just do not have time to do like proper contact tracing. So, but we are diagnosing people with gonorrhea and chlamydia and syphilis. So we really need to at least mention it to them that, you know, the patient has a responsibility, so to speak, to actually let as many people know as possible. The way I paint it is, look, you know, they might not know, they might not have any symptoms, and so, you know, they're, they're accidentally kind of, you know, spreading it around without not even knowing. So it's a nice, it's a nice thing to let them know so we can kind of get them tested. So I just wanted to let you know about those resources, which might be quite useful, particularly in GP land. And when they come back, if they come back for a follow-up, I often just say, hey, did you let those partners know? And then I'll just document it, you know, let five partners know. That's contact tracing for GPs. All right, uh, move on. Um, just quickly, uh, don't forget, oh, sorry, any questions about that? I think we're still uh, still on the same number of questions, so I think we're okay. Yeah, same number. Um, I might just ask, um, Brian, with the contact tracing, when if you yes. if someone is comes in and said, I've, I've received this message from this website, um, do I need treatment or do I test? They're asymptomatic. What, what, do they, what do we do? What do we say to them? So it depends on the infection. So if the infection's named, so generally, um, and also it depends on the patients as well. So if, it, if they're asymptomatic and it's for chlamydia and gonorrhea, I would usually just test them um, and wait for the results. Okay. Syphilis is the only one where I'd actively treat regardless because it can take a while for serology to become positive. Syphilis is the one that you offer treatment to contacts because um, it may take a while before you truly know that person has syphilis. So, so yeah, so for chlamydia and gonorrhea, I usually wouldn't um, unless they have to present with symptoms. Um, syphilis, yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, just one slide on vaccinations. They often get forgotten, uh, forgotten. Sorry, in STI consults, um, you're primarily thinking about it for your kind of higher risk groups. So definitely your MSM sex workers, but also recreational drug users. Um, but you know you can think about this for any of your patients. Um, Checking, uh, particularly in MSM and these groups, I'd want to know that they're immune to Hep A and Hep B. So you check their status, their antibodies, and if they're not, get them vaccinated. Don't forget about HPV vaccination. So, you know, it's a good opportunity in all STI consultations to make sure they had it. Some people missed out on it and they might be applicable for the catch up. Um, if you've got an MSM patient, please offer it. Um, if they're under 26, because the guidelines change, remember you just need one. If you're over 20, I think it's 26 or 25. No, it is 26. Um, if you're over 26, it's three vaccines. It's of course not free because um, it's not part of any schedule. Um, and as most of us know, Gardasil vaccines are pretty expensive. I think they're about 180, 200 bucks. Um, so, 
Definitely uh, HPV, um, much more common in MSM population. Um, and we need to be thinking about future risk of throat, penile and um, anal cancers as well. So um, the uh, MSM population don't really benefit from the herd immunity of uh, women being vaccinated at school because they're not part of that kind of micro uh, uh, kind of climate, so to speak. Um, so yeah, so don't forget HPV vaccines for your STI consultations. And now have a think about whether your patient should be uh, having an MPOX vaccine. And again, I'm, I'm gonna talk about that, all right. So that was just a one little brief um, page about vaccines. Before I go on to prep, any questions? I don't think there's any, any new questions there, yeah. Perfect, okay. This, I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this one because I literally, uh, and apologies, as I said, if you watched the presentation uh, from my colleague a couple of months ago, um, because uh, she covered this as well. So we're kind of gonna talk about the same thing, but um, I think um, I really enjoy prep consultation. So prep consultations for me, you know, you're having a crazy busy day and all you want is someone to walk in with a UTI just to give you a mental breather. Um, this is how prep feels to me now. If someone sits down and says, oh, I just need a prep script, I'm like, brilliant. So I go on autopilot. And if you do it enough times, you will too. And you'll be doing uh, those patients uh, a huge favor. Um, and you'll kind of go, that was a nice, easy consultation. So I can get on with the rest of my crazy day. So PrEP obviously stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and we're clearly talking about HIV here. Uh, this is the ASHAM website, which has a great uh, is a great resource for anyone who's kind of interested in it. You can kind of go and delve deep into it if you want to. It has a great resource on the types of people who you would be thinking about offering PrEP to. Um, it's very rarely, I, I don't really hunt people out for PrEP. They hunt me for PrEP. So usually they just come in saying, oh, I, I want some PrEP. And then I just talk about their history and yeah, perfect, here's your PrEP script. So it's not that I'm particularly screening people for PrEP. Um, most people who want it already know that they need it anyway. So, so this is just a bit of an overview from Asham of the types of people who would benefit from consideration of PEP. And it's primarily, so it says anyone at risk of HIV transmission, which in theory could be anybody, but obviously has these higher risk groups. Um, and it also says anyone who has had in the last three months or foresees risk in the following three months. So it talks about past and future risk. If we just look at the table sort of one by one, there's actually lots of duplication. But if you just look in the first column, men who have sex with men. Um, so it just talks about so if you've got MSM population, um, if that person's having receptive CLI is condomless intercourse uh, with any casual male partner. If they've got rectal gonorrhea, rectal chlamydia, or infectious syphilis, it tends to mean that they're having relatively uh, frequent unprotected sex, anal intercourse. Methamphetamine use is just associated with usually lack of condom use. Um, but also if you're having uh, unprotected sex with a regular HIV partner who's not on treatment and has a detectable viral load, okay? So obviously that those, those groups of people would definitely benefit from Right. Generally, most of the MSN patients who come and see me, they're not particularly, you know, high risk in terms of that. They just want PrEP as part of their ongoing, you know, that they recognize it's there and it's another avenue that they can protect themselves. They're thinking about kind of not using condoms too often. They're not so worried about any of the other STIs, but they're mainly worried about HIV. And in that, in that case, PrEP is fine. Um, some patients will say, I want to use PrEP and uh, I'll still use condoms. Um, just in case there's a condom accident, totally sensible. All right. And so, so we should be giving prep to people who kind of pretty much want it. Um, if you look at the trans and gender diverse uh, category, it's exactly the same risks. Okay. And the heterosexual kind of people is slightly different. So there's kind of a few unusual categories in here. So generally, if um, someone is hetero, a cisgender woman having sex with cisgender men, um, they the risk in Australia of them acquiring um, HIV is super low. I can't even think of the statistics, but it's so incredibly low. Obviously it's not zero, but so incredibly low. Um, but as a population, you wouldn't be targeting that population for the use of PrEP, okay? So generally in that scenario, you wouldn't be saying to someone, oh, you know, I would, the guidelines say uh, 
prep not recommended. Not recommended doesn't mean they can't have it, just not, not recommended. Um, but it, it talks about these group of heterosexual people. So it says receptive condomless intercourse with any casual MSM partner. So what that means is um, you are essentially having sex with someone who is perhaps bisexual. Um, they're obviously higher risk, so that means you are automatically higher risk. Um, it does say, oh, and I'm, even I'm a bit confused about this, because it does say a woman in a serodiscordant heterosexual relationship who is planning a natural conception in the next three months. What that means is woman is HIV negative, partner's HIV positive. I would assume that the partner was undetectable. And in those scenarios, you don't um, usually need PrEP. So, so from that point of view, I think it's just an extra kind of um, extra level of uh, risk reduction reduction during that time perhaps, but it's recommended. Um, or if you're a heterosexual person who is having sex with a HIV positive partner who is not on treatment and has a detectable viral load. Um, people who inject drugs, I don't see for PrEP at all. I've never, no one's come in saying I inject drugs so I want PrEP. Usually it's for sexual activity, but it is an option if they're sharing needles with someone who's known HIV um, or uh, belongs to uh, the MSM group of unknown HIV status. So that gives you a bit of an overview as to the people that Ashen believe would benefit from PrEP. They all sound pretty high risk, but the majority of people would just be uh, MSM coming in saying, hey, I think I, I think I want to go on PrEP. My friends are on it, you know, kind of thing. So virtually everyone's on PrEP now. So what the hell is PrEP? Um, so at the moment, Prep scripts is uh, it's called Truvada um, is its uh, brand name, but the generic contains two ingredients called tenofovir disoproxil and emtricitabine. So there's two ingredients. Uh, Truvada has been used as a HIV drug for probably about 15 years. Um, as a result, it's been trialed in lots of things. So it's been trialed in PEP prep trials. Um, so it tends to be the go-to because it has much more evidence base behind it. Um, it is available on the PBS as um, PrEP. You can prescribe three months worth. And for the patient, it costs about 30-ish a month. They can shop around. Um, you can prescribe it if they're non-Medicare and they can get it for a similar cost uh, online or through this website called PrEP Access Now. If you're a student, you can get free PrEP. There you go. So from that website, uh, most people kind of just pay about 30 bucks a month for it. Uh, there are a few alternatives. So that's what you will be mostly prescribing. It's where I mostly prescribe. Uh, there are some alternative preps, but they're actually not used well, either at all or commonly at the moment. If you notice the two ingredients in Truvada, the one at the top, it's tenofovir disaproxyl with emtricitabine. If you look at the one I've just kind of revealed below, it's tenofovir again, but you'll notice it's called alfanamide, but it also contains emtricitabine. So it's actually almost an identical drug, but its brand name is Descovy. Now the alfanamide bit is actually um, a slightly different chemical structure um, of tenofovir, which means that it, it gets into the cells um, at a higher intracellular concentration at much lower doses. Um, and that has some benefits, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and I'll, I'll explain as to why you choose that over Truvada in someone in a second. Um, so Descovy is approved for PrEP, but it's not on the PBS. So that makes it a bit difficult to prescribe. You can still give someone a script for Descovy um, and it's similar cost online. I think it's Green Cross Pharmacy. You can get it online and imported. So it's similar cost to Truvada. Um, if they go to a pharmacy in Australia, it's, it's often hundreds of dollars for Descovy. So it's important they get it online. But I imagine most people would just prescribe the top one, which is Truvada. Okay. Um, there is a long acting injectable option called Cabanuva. I say option because it's not really used yet. Um, so basically, what that is, is it's um, a HIV medication, um, which you inject a little bolus dose, one in each kind of uh, ventrogluteal muscle. So it's kind of just on the hips. Uh, it lasts about two months. We're actually using it a lot in HIV patients, working very successfully. Um, it is now, it has been successfully trialed as PrEP. Um, the downside is, is it's not uh, approved and not on the PBS. So if you were prescribing Cabanuva privately, the cost is in the thousands, like for just the two months. So its cost at this point in time is prohibitive. Uh, Vive, who... Um, 
uh, kind of create the drugs, they have this kind of compassionate scheme where you can kind of apply for it for certain patients. So, but I think um, the, applying for PrEP is probably going to be a bit of a challenge, but I suspect maybe in a year or two's time, we'll probably be having a very different conversation and saying, oh yeah, these are loads of options. Let's get on the long inject injectable for PrEP. Okay. Um, are there any contraindications? Is there anyone who shouldn't have PrEP? Well, the answer is probably not. You're going to see a very young, healthy, fit population. Um, and it's really just about renal function. So um, one of the cautions in Truvada is that it, it lowers your glomerular filtration rate. So if someone already has some in renal impairment, you probably don't want to be throwing some Truvada at them, which might make it worse. However, it is fine as long as their EGFR is above 60. And let's face it, we're going to be usually prescribing it in fit health. You know, people who are having sex tend to be fit, healthy, and uh, uh, kind of able-bodied. Um, so we don't find much renal impairment, but obviously it can still be out there. And I'll mention about testing in a second. So that's the only true contraindication. Um, you'll see Descovy, however, can be used at a much lower renal, in, renal function. Um, so this is where this would be used as an alternative. So, so Truvada has that risk factor of kind of causing some renal impairment. And what we don't know yet is the longer term consequences of that. So if someone was taking PrEP for years and years and we've artificially lowered their EGFR, what, what are actually the health consequences on, on that person? In HIV patients, we know that that leads to more renal problems, but it also leads to higher cardiovascular issues. So, so it's probably not a great idea to be on long term. And so, so this is um, why in some patients you might choose DESCOV um, if they've already got renal impairment or they have those future concerns. Um, the other risk factor of um, PrEP is that it causes bone mineral density reduction. It's thought to be reversal on stopping, but there's no clear guidance on how you monitor that. But again, it's likely the person's not going to be on PrEP for the next 50 years. It's more likely they'll use it for a short time, often stop it in a relationship, might use it a bit. So cumulatively over their lifetime, they're probably not going to be using PrEP a huge amount. It's just to prevent them during their risk uh, taking behaviours. So when we're talking about the reduction of harms of PrEP, I mean, look, it sounds scary, but actually I can't imagine anyone coming to any great harm. You could choose Descovy as an alternative, and I imagine in a year or two's time, we'll probably, we might even be prescribing this instead of Truvada if it goes on the PBS. Uh, the other way is you take on demand rather than continuously, so you're taking less tablets, which I'm going to talk about in a second, all right? So how, how do you take PrEP? two main ways. Um, you either take it daily, so you, you basically take one tablet of your Truvada daily. Um, it takes seven days for it to become effective as PrEP if you're taking it that way, and then basically you just carry on every single day, okay? You don't need to prepare, you can have sex whenever you want, um, you're unlikely to acquire HIV because you've got the drug on board constantly. The alternative way of taking it, which is pretty popular, is called on-demand. It is off-label, but um, huge amounts of um, evidence to back up um, that it works very effectively. This is only indicated for cisgender men who have sex with men. So if you're using it in women, uh, transgender, anyone with a neo-vagina or vagina, um, it must be used continuously because there isn't any evidence uh, for the on-demand um, in these groups of people. So um, so, so, so for, uh, for your MSM population, they can use on demand, but for everyone else, it needs to be continuous. Um, the other thing is, if you're going to give PrEP, we just need to be doubly sure that they're not hepatitis B positive. Um, the tenofovir is actually a treatment for chronic Hep B. It actually suppresses the virus. Um, so you need to know the Hep B status. But what you don't want someone with chronic Hep B is being on and off PrEP stopping and starting it because that's not going to be very good for your hep B. So you just need to double check that they're uh, hep B negative. Uh, and as I've said, the data for on demand is only available for true Vonda, um, but we can extrapolate it that it is likely to be the same for Descovy, given the fact that they're the same ingredients ever so slightly. So this is how you take, um, oh, I can't show you my little mouse, but if you look at the first um, 
I haven't got a little pointer, which would be handy, but if you look at the first table just to the left, so basically what you do is with on demand, you tell the patient to take two tablets of Truvada between 24 and two hours before having sex. So it does require a bit of planning. And then you have sex, great, fantastic. 24 hours later, you have another tablet. And then 24 hours after that, you have another tablet and then you stop. Okay, so that is your on-demand prep. So you're covering a particular event um, and that's how you take it. Um, if you look at the second one, obviously life's not as regimented as that and you might, you know, have a very fun weekend. You might have multiple episodes of sex. So if you, so it starts off the same. So you're, you know, you're planning your sexual activity. So you take your two tablets at least two hours or 24 hours to two hours. Then you have sex, you take one tablet the day after, but then you continue to have sex. So basically you keep taking one tablet until you are two days free of sexual activity. So it's always two days after your last sexual um, uh, sexual event. Uh, so, so although it's 2-1-1, it can become 2-1-1-1-1-1-1, depending on kind of how your life is going at that point. And some people start at 2-1-1 and then decide that they'll just take it continuously because it's, you know, less pre-planning. So, so it's whatever works for the patient, okay? This is a really amazing website called Ending HIV, and it has a great resource about PrEP. So I tell all my patients about it. So um, yeah, so just direct them to it. it has how you take it, um, what to do if you're late, you know, those kind of things. So uh, difference between continuous, um, if you're transgender, you know, how to use PrEP as well. So it, it kind of it kind of really great resource for anyone who's kind of thinking about PrEP or just starting PrEP as well. Um, and has lots of other useful information on that. Um, so if you're starting PrEP for the first time, so you're seeing someone for the first time, what we actually, the key thing we need to know is that you're HIV negative. So we need to be arranging that test. So we need a HIV negative test within seven days of starting the PrEP. Um, you can do it within the past four weeks if patients have difficult access, but I think in the city, it's fairly straightforward to get a HIV um, test uh, fairly quickly. As I've said, you need to make sure they're not chronic Hep B because you wouldn't be going down the prep pathway um, necessarily. Um, our patients are very rarely on medication, so we don't often need to review drug drug interactions. Um, but if you haven't used this website, you've probably used it loads during COVID to look for your COVID interactions, but um, the Liverpool HIV drug interactions website's great. You just type in on the left, the HIV drug, in this case, it's true Vada being used as PrEP. And then you just put a list on the right-hand column of the co-medications and it will then summarize as to whether there's any interactions. So, so just kind of before you start in prep, if someone is on medications, just double check there isn't any major interactions. There's very few to be quite honest. Um, side effects on prep are actually really rare. Most people don't get anything, they feel fine. Uh, some people when they first start feel a bit headache and nausea, but that seems to go very quickly, but it's the long-term issues with renal toxicity and, and bone density that are kind of the main concerns. And the guidelines say that you need to be monitored every three months, um, and, so, and that's regardless of whether you're taking it daily or on demand. So I always tell my patients, if you're taking it on demand, you're not likely to go through your three months script, but still come back and see me at three months if you can and they often don't they just come back at the end of the prep script six months later but I, I still tell them to come back at three months this is a bit of a kind of a, just a bit of a summary of what you would do in that prep consultation and I'll summarize it again to just make it even more simple uh, so basically patient comes to see you says I want to start prep take a bit of a sexual history yeah sounds sensible okay let's go for it you assess to make sure that they're not high risk of already having HIV. You would have done that through your sexual history and you're about to order a HIV test. You just double check that they're not known to have any renal problems and that they're not on any kind of medications that would interact. You can use that website if you want. That's where you give them a pathology form to go and get these tests. So you'd be doing HIV. First time you meet them, you do their hepatitis A, B and C, make sure they're all immune. Obviously an STI screen. Um, and this is where you do an EGF, so check their kidney function and uh, do a urine protein. So what you're doing is you're just screening for renal impairment there as a baseline. 
give them the prep script there and then you're allowed to prescribe it as this so um so if you type in truvada i uh, i use best practice it just automatically converts it to this so so it takes off the generic but it, it is still on there as a generic but or you can just find it under tenofovir um, it will come up um give them the script there and then and then what i say to them okay as long as all these tests come back as negative you can start your prep um, preferably within the next seven days. All right. So that's the quarter, the kind of sequence that you'd see. So again, busy table. I'm sorry, I haven't got my pointer because it doesn't work on my computer. So we've already, if you look at the first column, we've already done the baseline. We've already met them. Go to the second column, which says about 30 days after starting prep. You can see it just says HIV test. I don't bring patient and, and assess side effects. I don't bring patients back for that appointment. It's a, it's a recommendation. But what I do is I just give them a separate pathology form for a HIV test and say, just do, do that in about a month's time when you've been using PrEP. We just want to double check to make sure um, that your HIV is negative. What you're doing there is you're just making sure that you're not missing someone who might have been in a window period when you started PrEP. OK, so so it's just when you start it, try and test them about a month later. But I certainly don't bring them back for an appointment for that. I just give them a pathology form. Most people forget to do it, but um, it is it is a guidance. And then really all you do is you see them every three months for exactly, you know, rinse and repeat. So you basically prep script, STI screen, blood tests, um, and that's it. You, you literally carry on every three months. So once you've seen that patient the first few times, it is it is the most simple consultation. So, so it's kind of really straightforward. Uh, what about stopping? So, look if you're if they want to start, fine, great. If you're a cisgender MSM, as I've described, you stop it after two uh, two days. So you take two more days after your last sexual event and then stop it. For anyone else, it's twenty eight days, and that comes from if you think about what PEP is where you had to take a whole month's worth after an exposure. So the same principle applies for um, when you're stopping PrEP. So it's almost like you've gone into PEP mode just to make sure that they're not going to zero convert in that last month. OK, so but for most of our MSMs, they can stop after two days. But for anyone else, you just say, look, carry on for a month before stopping just to be sure. Um, and this is just I'm, my step. Brian, I'm just going to. Just interrupt you for one moment, yes. just, just to say we're 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 at time. Oh, are well, we already? So, yes, uh, we are. But, but but please do keep going for, for everyone who wants to continue to listen. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, well, what I'll do is I'll just whiz through the monkeypox bit and then I'll leave it because um I, I just wanted to make sure everyone was happy prescribing prep. So look, in terms of the prep, so this is the it's very straightforward. So suitability, give them a path form for HIV syphilis hepatitis, STI screen, kidney function, urine. You can pre-program this on best practice. So you can have a little section saying prep. Um, give them the prep script. If their results are good, so you can send them a text message and say, hey, go, go ahead with your prep. Um, and then give them a separate HIV form to do at four weeks, just as per guidance. And then you just see them every three months for their prep, okay? So simple as that. Before I move on, I know we're now really short on time. God, I didn't realize that, um, that I'd overrun. Um, any questions about the prep bit before I quickly whiz through monkeypox? And I will whiz through it. Was, uh, uh, I think there's a question from Cassie about Viv recently withdrawing the application for PBS funding uh, for CAB, but uh, uh, I, I'm, maybe that's something you can address later. Yeah, if you can, I can always um, pass out my details. So if anyone has any particular questions about that, so um, yeah, um, fund, funding is always um, being withdrawn. <laughs> uh, look, uh, monkeypox. Um, I'll just kind of whiz through it because we're in a bit of an outbreak. So I appreciate. Sorry, I didn't realise I'd overrun. Um, I was asked to kind of include this just because we're at the start of another outbreak. So I'll just kind of whiz through this. So look. It's a viral zoonosis, uh, it belongs to the orthopox virus. Um, it's mainly endemic in Central and Western Africa, and it's actually animals that carry it and give it to the kind of locals there. Um, it is related to smallpox. 
So, um, but with the eradication of smallpox in the 1980s, then it's really monkeypox that has become now the replacement of the pox virus. The symptoms are actually very similar to smallpox, although the rash is usually much less severe, okay? Um, the reason we're concerned about it now is since May 2022, there's been a, a big increase in monkeypox cases from, where, from multiple countries where they're not usually seen at all. Um, it's occurring in human to human transmission. So primarily in those endemic areas, it tends to be animal to human, and then it's kind of locally through human, but here it's human to human. Um, and it's through sexual networks, and it's primarily gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men. It tends to be in the higher risk MSM group. So uh, guys who perhaps travel um, abroad, multiple sexual partners, go to sex on premises venues, sex parties, chem sex type things. So it tends to be concentrated. Uh, the cases so far tends to be concentrated in those uh, fairly uh, higher risk guys, but obviously those higher risk guys can then go and have sex with perhaps less high risk guys. So it kind of filters out into the community that way. So, so it's just important we need to be aware of it. It is a notifiable um, infection since June 2022. Uh, this is what's happened with the outbreak. So if you remember, it arrived on our shores in 2022 when we were all uh, fatigued from the first pandemic. So. Um, we were a bit weirded out by a second one uh, about to arrive, but um, the government were pretty kind of rapid and vaccinated lots of people and it kind of fizzled out. But if you kind of fast forward to that graph in June, you can see there's a bit of a spike. You'll see it falls, but that's because we don't have the data yet for July. So it's, it's, it's probably going to kind of spike up again. Uh, the outbreak started in Victoria and it's now spilled over into New South Wales. So it's definitely here. Um, deaths are rare, but they have occurred around the world. Um, there's been about 160 deaths in countries that don't usually have uh, monkeypox, but it tends to be in kind of people with comorbidities or immunocompromised. There's been no deaths in Australia to date. Symptoms. So you kind of need to be aware of this. So symptoms. So it usually starts after one to uh, sorry, seven to 14 days after exposure. So the incubation is between three and 12 days. This is the rash. So you get a rash and it's usually a pimple like sore. And it's it says particularly in areas that are hard to see. So it's genitals, anus, buttocks, but you can get them on face, arms and legs. Uh, they can also present as ulcers uh, in the mouth and mucosal surfaces, and this is why it can present as a proctitis. Um, and prior to the onset of the rash, lots of people do experience the viral prodrome as well, so usual flu-like illness, so fever, headache, muscle aches, swollen lymph nodes, um, prior to uh, the appearance of the rash. Uh, they start off, if you look at the first picture on the left, they start off as a red rash and then they develop into these pustules and the pictures on the right are sort of fairly classical. So they're kind of like, they're like a big chunky molluscum with a hard black scabby centre. That's scabby center. So um, that's kind of what they look like when you look at them closer. Um, so that's the symptoms that we're looking out for. These are other glorious pictures of monkeypox. So you can see how they kind of look different to most other STIs. So you probably look at it and go, mm, could that be herpes? Could it be what? It just doesn't look like any of them. So this is when you have to be suspicious of monkeypox. You can get it at other sites. They look a bit vague at other sites. So it's really genital sites where it's a bit more obvious. Um, it's spread skin to skin contact. Um, it's thought to be sexually transmitted. Um, there is some virus in semen, but it's usually um, con direct contact with pustules. Respiratory and kind of bedding and clothing is thought to be possible, but super rare. Um, and people are with monkeypox are infectious. Uh, from the time they get symptoms until their lesions have all crusted, the scabs have fallen off and a fresh layer of skin has formed underneath. So it's actually typically about two to four weeks. So they have quite a long infectivity period. Um, most of our MSN population are vaccinated, um, but you can still get monkeypox. And if you get monkeypox, it's uh, a much milder version of it. So you, you'll usually see less lesions and they're un unlikely to be unwell with it. In most people, it's a self-limiting infection. So all they'll need is to go home, isolate, supportive management, pain relief, antibiotics if they get cellulitis, 
um, and that's all they'll need. Some people, if they become sick, um, you'll need to speak to infectious diseases. So you're, there is a treatment for it, an antiviral treatment, and apparently it's only available at Westmead Hospital where they have a biocontainment unit. So if you saw someone with monkeypox who was actually quite systemically unwell, I would imagine you'd be speaking to ID to kind of get an idea as to where you send this person. So we're more likely to just see very you know healthy people, few lesions, send them home to ICU. We got this sent this update probably about three weeks ago. So this was pinned up in our um, waiting room. So um, hopefully everybody saw that. And it's just a bit of an update that it's circulating on what to do. Bit of a reminder um, that you might see milder variants in vaccinated people. And the key thing is it just said encourage vaccination for eligible people. So this is all of your MSN population that you're seeing. So make sure, that's why I mentioned the vaccinations, but make sure you're mentioning monkeypox at the moment. The tricky thing is, is there are too many guidelines out there and I was trying to summarize it for everybody and actually it's super confusing. So this is the Southeastern Pathways, um, this is the, there's the STI guidelines and there's the monkeypox as well. So, uh, sorry, there's the ASHEN and they all say slightly different things. But they all hark back from 2022 before vaccination when everyone was worried about it. So they're a bit overkill with their and a PPE and room cleaning and I'll explain why in a second. So what do we need to do as GPs if we kind of think someone, we've got to consider it if someone mentions they've got these weird type of ulcers or particularly if they've recently traveled or they're a known contact. Um, as I've said, uh, blistery type lesions, they'll often describe them as, you know, they seem like big blisters with black spots in them. That's how they sort of say and not many things present like that. Um, if they're vaccinated, they'll probably just have only one or two. Uh, sometimes it might be a proctitis that they're presenting with, and they might say prodrome, um, have uh, prodrome symptoms. Um, but everyone's got prodrome symptoms at the moment with all the respiratory viruses going around, so it's a bit confusing. So this is the kind of key thing. So the guidelines are actually uh, what we do as GPs and what we do in the in the kind of uh kind of uh, outside hospital settings is it's a bit tricky if you read the guidelines it very clearly states that infection control protocols should be in place and if you read it i'll, I'll show you on the next slide it's actually quite full on it says get in your full ppe uh, take them in a separate room you know don't let them use the bathroom cover up any lesions um, and then when you've sent them home and you've done your swabs, then you need to do a deep terminal clean of that room before you can use it again. Now, that is just not practical in GP land. That is still on the guidelines as we speak as to what you're supposed to do if you see them. So it actually makes it a bit of a barrier should a patient come to GP with monkeypox as to what to do with that patient. The guidelines are being reviewed now because we now know respiratory and formite transmission are actually very unlikely. So it's more than likely going to change where it is we can swap them you know we just get a, a, you know our usual pp that we would have used for covid a quick swab orange flock swab send it off and send the patient home and just let public health know but for the time being if you see someone with public health because those guidelines have not changed yet i would phone public health first before examining them um, and the numbers are on that update that was sent out and there's a few other numbers. You can call your local sexual health clinic as well, who will guide you as to what to do. Because that whole terminal clean thing just isn't practical in GP at this point until they change the guidelines. I'd be more than, I'd be more than comfortable swapping it myself, but that's just me. Um, but I, the guidelines are likely to change where it's just put your yeah, simple PPE on, swap it, send them home. That is the list of current infection control that it's telling us we must do for monkeypox cases. So isolate, surgical mask, clean the room, terminal clean, N25, uh, N95 mask. It's just not practical in GP settings, so it's likely that this will be done away with. Um, but at least if you identify someone with monkeypox, don't just send them away, phone public health because they'll kind of guide you what to do. Um, when we do swab them, simple, you just swab them with a dry flux swab, um, send it to your pathology provider, do phone your pathology provider because they might want it double bagging, they have different rules, um, and then just send it off, send your patient home, um, they need to self isolate. And you give them this, um, this is online, you kind of refer them as to what self isolation looks like, 
which is this. Okay, so they stay home and they might have to stay home for about two to four weeks. They can go out. Uh, you can't, it's not like COVID. You can go out. You just have to wear a mask, cover your sores, but stay at home as much as possible. And it's just no close contact is the key thing and careful hand hygiene. All right. Um, you don't need to manage this. You know, everyone's going to go home and they're going to be fine. They might get cellulitis. You might just give them a bit of flu flocks. Um, if it's severe, you'd be, they'd be under infectious disease anyway, so you don't need to know about that. Um, this is the key thing, get everyone vaccinated. Um, the vaccine's called, I think it's pronounced Genius. Um, so it's a smallpox and monkeypox vaccine uh, that's over from America. You need two doses. So uh, one dose provides about 65% protection. You need a second dose about one month later, and that provides 85% protection, okay? Uh, not many practices are actually involved in smallpox vaccines. It tends to be the sexual health clinics. Um, if you actually saw someone or had a telephone consultation with someone who just been told that they'd had were a contact of monkeypox, get them vaccinated. So you just you just send them to get vaccinated because you can use the vaccine as PEP post exposure prophylaxis, preferably within four days of being uh, a contact, but up to fourteen days. All right. That's all the sexual health clinics. If you, if you Google, where can I get a monkeypox vaccine? That is the list that appears under New South Wales Health. So all of the sexual health clinics, including mine, do monkeypox vaccines. So when you're speaking to your MSMs and doing prep excellently now, from now on, um, double check that they've had a monkeypox vaccine. And if they haven't, um, get them to get in contact with their sexual health clinic so that they get at least their first vaccine, given we're in this bit of an up spike at the moment. But if you do see someone, I'd be phoning your public health for advice on what you should do with that particular patient so that they're not left to kind of, you know, Google online or, you know, um, so they're not left meandering, wondering what to do. Public health will guide you as to exactly what to do.